year, the conservation district received a cold water heritage grant, um, uh, or uh, a co yeah, cold water heritage partnership grant to develop a cold water conservation plan for the upper Standing Stone Creek. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the cold water uh, heritage partnership, it's kind of this joint collaborative between a couple uh, state agencies and uh, organizations. Um, they're listed below, say it's the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, um, PA Fish and Boat Commission, the Foundation for Pennsylvania Watersheds, and then the uh, Pennsylvania Council of Trout Unlimited are the four main uh, components for the, the CHP. Uh, so anyway, so the purpose for this plan, uh, we kind of broke it into three uh, main objectives. Uh, one is to assess the current water quality conditions uh, of Standing Stone Creek, or at least the upper half of the watershed. Um, two is to establish uh, some baseline stream data uh, in this watershed that we can use to track uh, improvements or reductions in water quality over time. Um, and three, which we'll touch on a little bit in this presentation, um, is to address the future management, improvement, and conservation strategies uh, for this watershed. Um, so for today, we're going to focus on objectives one and two, really what we, what we did, what we found, and what that means as far as moving forward with conservation um, in this area. Uh, and one last note, just upon completion of this conservation plan, um, the Conservation District will qualify to apply for future um, CHP grants uh, that will actually fund restoration projects in this watershed. So that's uh, another big component as to why we wanted to um, put this plan together, because as you'll see here in a moment, Standing Stone Creek's a pretty, pretty significant watershed in Huntington County. So just to kind of kick things off, um, this is the Upper Standing Stone Creek watershed. Uh, located in northeastern Huntington County, kind of crosses over the, the center county line a little bit, a um, little bit in uh, Mifflin County. Um, you can kind of see I kind of added a couple towns just to give you an idea where we're at geographically. We got McAlevey's Fort here down in the middle. 26 kind of comes up over the mountain down over to Pine Grove Mills over in center county. Um, but for the most part, this is our uh, study area. Uh, under this plan, we are defining the upper Standing Stone Creek as everything upstream of the confluence of the East Branch Standing Stone Creek and uh, Standing Stone Creek itself. So that's kind of this, this white shape that's outlined. Um, out of curiosity, can you guys see my mouse as well? Sometimes I point it at the screen thinking people can see it as a pointer and okay, that's all right. Just so I know so I don't look like a goober head thinking everybody can, can see it. Um, so anyway, so just kind of a real brief intro of it. Uh, so this watershed's approximately 88 square miles. Um, as far as composition, it's about 85% forest. A lot of that is actually Rothrock State Forest. Um, and then we have about 10% in agriculture and 5% that's urban and developed. Um, and you can really see um, on the map, that center part, you can kind of see the, the change in land use from uh, forest to, to ag. So about 85 forest, 15% ag and, ag and urban development. So kind of to break it down uh, a little further. Uh, so this watershed is comprised of three HUC-12 watersheds, which is just the United States uh, Geo uh, Geological Survey's way of kind of breaking down watersheds. Um, so the first is Laurel Run. If you're familiar with Laurel Run, it dumps into Standing Stone Creek at McAlevey's Fort flows kind of upstream into Rothrock State Forest through Whipple Dam State Park, and then all the way up over, uh, over the mountain, actually into Center County. In addition to that, uh, we also have the East Branch of Standing Stone Creek. Um, that dumps into Standing Stone Creek along, I believe it's Martin Gap Road, uh, flows upstream again up into Rothrock State Forest, but this time it goes through uh, Greenwood Furnace State Park. And then lastly, um, our middle one is actually defined as the Upper Standing Stone Creek uh, watershed. That's this middle part that's still white. Um, again, kind of flows upstream through Roth Rock. Uh, and this one actually goes all the way up through uh, Penn Roosevelt State Park. So just kind of give you an idea where we're at, what we're looking at. Um, this watershed's uh, very significant, both economically and ecologically in Huntington County. So in total, uh, it includes about 98 stream miles, uh, of which, uh, so this watershed comprises the headwaters to Huntington Burroughs and Smithfield Township's drinking water supply. 
So that's around 13,000 people. Um, in addition to that, it's also a very popular trout fishing destination um, as far and as well as uh, going through those state parks uh, gets a lot of recreational use as well. Um, ecologically, in terms of water quality, it's also unique. Um, so these 98 stream miles are all categorized as high quality cold water fishery um, in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, essentially what this is, is uh, the Department of Environmental Protection's method of kind of ranking streams on their water quality. Uh, so if we break it down, uh, you have this CWF, cold water fishery. So they've identified that this watershed should support cold water species such as trout. Um, and in addition to that, it also gets this HQ, this high quality category, meaning that this water is some of the best of the best in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, this is the second highest uh, protection you can give to a, a water, um, meaning it's, uh, again, it's kind of the best of the best. The only one that's better than that is what they call an exceptional value or an EV cold water fishery. Um, and we don't have any of those in Huntington County, sadly. Uh, moving forward from that, uh, I think it's around 30% of Huntington or of Pennsylvania's waters are considered high quality cold water fishery, but less than 2% are considered natural reproduction trout pop or yeah, nat natural reproduction trout waters, meaning that they sustain um, wild trout populations. Uh, if you see here in the yellow on the streams, uh, 54 stream miles of this watershed are listed as natural reproduction trout. Uh, so over half of our stream mileage, which is uh, crazy unique in terms of water quality. Um, and in addition to that, here in the pink, uh, you'll see that we also have several miles that are listed as class A trout waters. So this long stretch down here on the East Branch is uh, class A wild brown trout. There's around eight stream miles listed as that. And then up here, uh, a little tributary to Laurel Run, which I believe is the Shingles Town. Uh, run or Shinglestown branch is listed as class A wild brook trout. So just to kind of give an overview of the watershed, um, again, very significant in Huntington County, which is why we wanted to write this conservation plan. So kind of moving forward to what we did. So we examined 10 sites uh, spread out throughout the watershed uh, for our water quality assessment. Um, we kind of spread them out to really encapsulate a snapshot of the entire watershed. Uh, a lot of these sites, uh, we picked a downstream and an upstream site, so we can kind of get an idea of how it's changing. Uh, we have three sites on the main stem of Standing Stone Creek. We have two sites on Laurel Run, two sites on the east branch of Standing Stone Creek. And then in addition to that, we have three sites on this little tributary down here in the bottom left corner uh, called Harrod Run or Harrod Run um, that dumps right into Standing Stone Creek. So again, we spread them out. We wanted to make sure that we got uh, a good snapshot analysis of the whole area, um, and as well as a number of different uh, kind of micro habitats. Uh, in addition to those 10 sites, we also sampled one uh, site downstream outside of this entire study area. Uh, and that site was at Detweiler Park in Huntington. And just to show you that, um, here's the map. Uh, the black line actually represents all of Standing Stone Creek. Um, the white is the upper half of the watershed, which is the focus of this study. Um, and this downstream site uh, is our, our reference site. That's at Detweiler Park in, in Huntington. So that's the only time I'm going to show you this map, but just to give you an idea of where that's at. Um, yeah. So again, just kind of emphasize the, the study sites. Um, we wanted to make sure we encapsulated a number of kind of different habitats. So we have some sites that were taken in uh, kind of some open areas like in the top left picture, um, some semi-forested area like the two middle ones. Uh, you can see that there's some trees growing along the edge, but actually on either side of that, um, we have some open, open crop fields and, and development uh, all the way to these two photos here on the right that represents some uh, really heavily forested um, sample sites. So what did we do? So for this water quality assessment, we used um, an integrated approach, I'll call it, 
in that we sampled or we wanted to collect a number of different stream characteristics through this study. So everything we did was in accordance with uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection protocols. And again, we wanted to make sure we were, we were highlighting uh, specific stream characteristics, specifically the, the chemical, uh, the physical, and the biological. Um, so to do that, we did two, um, I guess I'll call them primary field assessments. Uh, the first was in the spring between March and April. Uh, during that time, we measured water chemistry, uh, physical habitat, and then the benthic macroinvertebrates, which is uh, the, a group of, uh, I guess, like aquatic insects, uh, things like mayflies, stoneflies, um, crayfish, snails, that all that type of stuff kind of falls into that category. Um, and with that, we use that to an assess uh, an index of biological integrity, which I'll dive into in a little bit. And then in addition to all that, uh, in the summertime, we actually did um, some fish biodiversity surveys to, uh, to throw fish into the mix as a, a biological parameter. Um, and from that, we calculate a thermal fish index, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as well when we get to there. So kind of going into what we found. So using um, a handheld YSI Pro Plus meter, which is just kind of uh, a meter you hold in your hand with a long cord, and then there's a probe on the end, you stick the probe in the water, you let it sit for like a minute or two to stabilize, and then you read off all your, all your measurements. Um, so what we did is we measured five um, specifically. We looked at temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, specific conductivity, and total dissolved solids. Um, now water quality or water chemistry is really important to measure, but I do wanna point out that this is probably our most limited uh, parameter that we measured. Um, and that we're limited to how much we can interpret from it uh, because our data is not continuous. So essentially we went to a site, we put the probe in the water and we read the, or the parameters at that specific time. Water chemistry can be really variable in that uh, if we were to measure it in the morning versus the middle of the day versus at night, we could get some different values. Uh, it can also vary with flows. It can vary with season. Um, so what DEP likes to do is actually take a probe, stick it in the water, and then you leave it there for a week or two and kind of collect increments every, say, 15 minutes um, is what they like to see. We did not have the resources to do that. So essentially ours is just collected in the moment. Um, so we are limited to what we can interpret from that. But with that being said, this chart down below kind of highlights just what we found. Um, and you don't have to go through every single one of those. Um, honestly, there's not a whole lot that really catches our eye. Um, but one thing that does stand out is that this. Yeah, you guys can see that red circle, right? Um, these two values here along two sites along Herod Run. Um, and there actually are specific conductivity and total dissolved solids, which are very similar measurements. Um, but I wanna actually focus a bit here on specific conductivity. Um, so what is specific conductivity? Um, it's one of the most frequently measured and useful water quality parameters. And essentially it's a measure of how much stuff is dissolved in the water. Um, the problem with this is uh, it's really useful to know, but we don't always know what the stuff is. So it can be indicative of high levels of things like salt um, heavy metals, uh, nutrients and fertilizers, pesticides and herbicides. Um, so things like salt can come from, uh, actually this time of year, um, we spread it on our roads uh, in the winter time, then we get spring rains. That can wash into the streams and cause uh, some elevated levels of, of conductivity. Heavy metals are really popular with uh, acid mine drainage, especially in Western PA. And then things from uh, like agricultural areas or even urban areas, people applying it to their, to their lawns, um, nutrients, fertilizers, um, pesticides, and herbicides. So here, just to kind of break it out, we have a chart. Um, you can see how significantly higher those two sites are compared to everything else. And actually, hopefully this works. If we average the value um, of all of the sites, uh, except for those two, we get an average value of 74 um, uh, microsiemens per centimeter, which is the units for conductivity. 
um, if we put that on the graph, you can see kind of how that stands out uh, with those two sites. Um, so that just kind of draws our attention to that area um, as essentially something we, we, we can conclude from that water chemistry parameter. Um, so if we go to a map, uh, again, that value is significantly higher. So it kind of draws our attention to this area of the watershed is, hey, maybe something's going on in this area that we have those significantly higher um, values compared to everywhere else. So to move on from water chemistry, we also measured the physical habitat of all of our sites. Um, the way this works is we measure 12 parameters over a 100 meter stream reach. Um, and they can be things like, is there sedimentation? Um, are the stream banks eroding? Uh, is, there tree, is there tree cover? Uh, what does the fish habitat look like? Are there submerged boulders? Are there submerged logs? Um, a, number of, a number of different things. Um, if you take a look at uh, some of these photos I showed you earlier, uh, this top left one, you can see that, yeah, there's not, there's a, some, some erosion go along, along those stream banks, um, but there's not a lot of trees there. Um, so that would get uh, kind of a lower score. Whereas if you jump over to this top right photo, you can see that there's tree, pretty heavy tree cover on the right side, not so much on the left side, but that stream bank, although it doesn't look it in the picture, um, is actually like six to seven feet tall. So we have a very significant um, stream bank erosion right there. Um, so we take stuff like that into account. Um, in this bottom left picture, you can see uh, very carefully around that stream bend, there's actually sediment depositing, um, probably indicative of a source of, of sediment upstream of that, that it's all settling out here. Uh, and then this bottom right site, um, again, it's kind of our pristine site, I would say. Um, you got nice riffles, you got nice submerged habitat, lots of tree cover, um, not a lot of eroding banks, that type of stuff. Um, so going back, uh, essentially what we do is we rank each of these parameters on a scale of one to 20. And then after we go through the whole assessment, we add all of those parameter uh, scores together to get this kind of total habitat score. Uh, and then we rate it as the following. So an optimal habitat, gets a score of 240 to 181, suboptimal is 180 to 121, um, and then you have marginal and poor. Typically, what we wanna see is habitats that fall in this optimal to suboptimal range. Um, we start getting concerned when we see this marginal, and then especially uh, when we see this poor habitat rank, we get um, really concerned. Um, so what did we find after we looked at everything? So again, just to kind of highlight everything out, um, our habitat actually came back pretty good. We had four sites that fell within this optimal range. We had six sites that fell within this suboptimal range. And then we had one site that fell below that, that marginal range and just by a bit. And then we didn't have any in the poor range, which is pretty good. So again, kind of drawing our attention to this site. I mean, the habitat uh, wasn't the greatest, um, if you recognize this site ID, this is the same one we looked at before with the water chemistry. And so when we take a look at the map again, and we highlight it, again, our attention is kind of being drawn to this area of the watershed. Um, our water chemistry kind of drew our attention there. Now our habitat um, scores are drawing our attention there. So moving on from the habitat then leads us into probably our biggest and most important parameter that we assess during this, um, this study. So bendic macroinvertebrates or the stream insects, crayfish, all that type of stuff. Um, many of you have probably heard that you can use um, these organisms as bioindicators of water quality uh, in that certain species can show that you have healthy water versus unhealthy water. Um, we take it to a different level of, of assessment um, so essentially what we do is at each site, we use a very fine meshed net. Uh, you can see me standing there in the water. We place that down on the stream substrate. I then stand upstream of the net and kind of kick over and shushel all the rocks and substrate to dislodge the bendic macroinvertebrates so that they flow down into the net. And then afterwards we take everything that fell into the net 
we stick it in a jar and we pour ethanol in there. And for each site, we do that six times over a hundred meter reach. So we call that a six kick composite sample because every kick's getting thrown into the same jar um, per site. Afterwards, rather than going through and identifying thousands and thousands of, of insects and all that type of stuff in a sample, um, we dump the sample into a tray like in the picture in the right. Um, and we do a subsample and our goal is to pick out 200 organisms and those are the ones that we identify. Um, so using these little metal, um, we affectionately call them cookie cutters um, to cut out certain chunks of the sample. Um, again, pick out the organisms and then that's what we are identifying to the genus level. We then take those identified organisms and use that to calculate our index of biological integrity or IBI. So this is a term that many people aren't familiar with, um, but essentially what I want you to know is that this is a metric that we use to quantify stream health. So essentially we're taking bugs from the stream and we are identifying them, putting them into an Excel sheet. The Excel sheet takes into account how abundant certain species are, how sensitive to pollution certain species are, and then giving us a number. And that number allows us to, um, uh, or allows it to be easier to compare between sites, as well as uh, interpret the data easier. Uh, so again, it's a metric to quantify stream health. And then what I do is I actually standardize it to a scale of zero to 100 to make uh, comparison and in interpretation much, much easier. Um, so if, getting a score of zero is on the bad end of things, meaning that you have a very unhealthy site, whereas a score of 100 means you have pretty much as good as you can possibly get it. Um, that's uh, a very, very healthy site. You don't very often get zeros or 100s, but usually it's pretty in between. Um, so again, identifying the genus level, we have just some examples down here of what we find. Um, stoneflies and mayflies are two very popular ones that people associate with uh, clean, healthy water quality. Um, if you're a, a fly fisherman, which I know we have several on here, this mayfly is actually a, an ephemera. Uh, and if I was to identify it to species, I'd probably say it's uh, ephemera, I think Danica, which is the green drake, um, which is a very popular uh, fly, especially on Penn's Creek. Um, but yeah, so this is just some of the organisms we find uh, but we find a variety. But anyway, going back to this IBI, essentially what we want to get out of this is what the value is. What's this total IBI score? Because for a high quality cold water fishery stream like Standing Stone Creek, anything that has an IBI that falls below 63 can actually be considered to be impaired. Um, and essentially what that means is that it fails to meet the biological water quality um, criteria of a stream. Um, and the state will recognize the water as, as being impaired because of that. And that's what we wanted to try and identify. So here's what we found. We went through and did the IBIs at all of our sites. And if I add this line, this is our threshold, our impairment threshold of 63. You can see that we got a couple below that line and we have a couple right on that line and then several quite a bit above. So just uh, some of the more significant findings from this. Uh, first and foremost are these two sites that are well below that impairment threshold. Um, both of these sites are along Herod Run. Um, they scored a 34.5 and a 49.0. Um, so significantly below that, that threshold of 63. In addition to that, we also have three sites that scored very, very close to that threshold line. Um, so the other one uh, was on Herod Run as well. But then we also had two, our two sites on the east branch of Standing Stone Creek. So our downstream one, which is 01, and our upstream one, which is 02. Both of those fell very, very close to falling below that threshold, um, which is still concerning even though they didn't officially. Um, and then on a more positive note, one of the other significant finds we found is that we had an IBI that was uh, exceptionally high, um, actually, I guess pun intended, um, 
in that it was greater than 92. Um, so this site was uh, along Standing Stone Creek in the Allen Seeger Natural Area. It scored a 93.8. Um, and according to the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, any sites that receive an IBI score greater than 92 can actually qualify to be upgraded from high quality to exceptional value cold water fishery. So that's a really exciting find to, to have from our, our macroinvertebrate data. Um, so now to kind of put this on a map and summarize hey, Logan, it a little more of what this all means. Logan, if I can interrupt, can you, can you tell me the stream miles for that exceptional value stretch? I... I do not know it off the top of my head, but I can okay. show you here on a map real quick. We're going to okay. kind of go over it a little more. Thanks. Yep. So here are those sites that we kind of outlined, um, or at least that stood out. These other four that don't have labels to them, um, they had very healthy IBIs. They're not really concerning. They're not really impressive. Um, they're where they, where they should be. Um, but to draw our attention to um, the three on Herod Run, so... Herod Run appears to be the most impacted um, from what we're finding. So our water chemistry pointed to it, our habitat pointed to it, and now our bendic macroinvertebrates are pointing to it. So what this means is that this area um, is experiencing some kind of, of environmental impact. Um, it's hard to say what that is for short, um, but it draws attention that we need to be focusing some conservation efforts um, to this area as uh, the water quality that's dumping into Standing Stone Creek could be impacting everything downstream of it. In addition to that, um, with the findings we have from our Bendic macroinvertebrates, we also submitted this to DEP uh, with an official recommendation that we list Herod Run as an impaired stream. Um, and I guess before anybody gets nervous about that, um, when a stream gets listed as impaired, um, it's not a anybody gets in trouble for anything all it does is kind of highlight um, to the state that, hey, this stream's um, being impacted to some degree. And actually what happens is you can uh, actually increase your chances of qualifying for grant funds to do projects in that watershed um, because of that impact. So that's kind of what we wanna, what we're trying to get out of this is really drawing attention to this area um, so we can improve our chances of uh, uh, resolving the issue. Um, in addition to that, we had those two scores that were not below the, the 63 threshold, but very, very close on the East Branch. Um, so it's hard to say what we need to do here, um, but uh, our recommendation is that we need to do some pretty close uh, continued stream monitoring on this section uh, to make sure that uh, those IBIs don't drop below that threshold. Um, so maybe we're catching it right at that, um, that convergence point that's going to start falling below. Um, but if we, we want to make sure we're, we're following along that if it is degrading, we want to be able to track that and improve that over time. Um, so we can focus more attention to this watershed as well um, and do similar restoration projects. Um, and now for the more positive note, um, it looks like a section of Standing Stone Creek is uh, potentially due for an upgrade. Um, so again, uh, we had an IBI value that was exceptionally high. It was above 92, which is that threshold for uh, exceptional value status. Um, so when we submitted all this data, we made that recommendation about Herod Run to be listed as impaired. We also recommended that we upgrade this section of Standing Stone Creek as uh, exceptional value. The sample site we collected is located in Allen Seeger Natural Area. And then this reach actually flows upstream through the forest um, through Penn's, Penn's Roosevelt State Park. Um, so just to give you some, some geography on where we're at um, in that watershed. Um, essentially, when you upgrade something from high quality to EV, uh, again, it adds additional protections. So EV is the highest status you can get in terms of uh, protections for a stream. Um, and if approved, this would be the very first and only um, EV stream in the entire county, which would be um, very, very, very neat and impressive um, if, if DEP decides to take our recommendation into account and approve, approve this upgrade. Um, 
I have not heard back from them on, on the status of that. And honestly, that could be a, a year or two long process. Um, but we'll see. We're going to keep on it. So moving along from the Bendic macroinvertebrates. Um, so I mentioned that we also did some fish biodiversity um, surveys in the summertime. Uh, specifically, we did one week in July. Um, we partnered with the Juniata College um, Department of Environmental Science and Studies. They had several students that were summer interns. Um, and we were able to borrow them for a week. Um, and we essentially, we completed these surveys uh, using backpack electrofishing units. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, you can see a picture. Um, this is uh, Nick, he was one of our students. He's got this backpack unit on his back. And then from that, there's a battery in there um, and a long probe that he's holding in his hand. And essentially when he presses the trigger on the probe, it emits uh, an electrical current into the water that allows us to temporarily stun the fish, making them easier to capture. Um, if you were to see us running around without this, just trying to net fish, um, that would be pretty entertaining, but they're very difficult to just do that way. So this makes it much, much easier um, and actually much more beneficial in terms of uh, getting useful data out of. Uh, so essentially what we did is we uh, typically we would shock a hundred meter reach. Um, sometimes it was a little longer depending on how wide the stream was. We would make a uh, strong effort to capture every stunned fish that we saw. We would place them into buckets and then we would regularly exchange the water in the buckets to make sure that um, they were getting enough oxygen, they weren't overheating. Um, usually after a minute or two of being stunned, they flip right over and start swimming around again. Um, maybe sometimes a little longer, maybe three, four minutes, but very, very, very minimal uh, uh, recovery time. Um, after we sampled the whole reach, we would take everything that was in the bucket and identify it um, and count how many uh, we found of each species. And then afterwards, we made sure we released everything back into the stream where we caught it. Um, we didn't, we did not keep anything. Everything was released unharmed. Hey, Logan, before you um, go much further, we have a couple questions for you. Sure. Uh, so how approximately how many miles do you think there are between the two sites on East Branch? And do you think the two that are near the 63 IBI scores suggest the entire stream is close to being impaired or could there be stretches of higher IBIs between them? I think there's a chance we could have um, some higher IBIs between them. Um, so usually what we're finding at these sites when we measure an IBI is it's not, it's hard to say it's the local um, land use that's impacting that. Uh, really it's everything upstream that's all washing down to that point. Um, so I guess when we're looking at these two lower IBIs on the East Branch, um, my guess is that something just upstream of this lower point um, is probably impacting that score at the downstream site. Uh, and then for this upstream site, um, it's, it's tough to say what's going on there. We had a really, really low IBI score. Um, but I guess I should also note that I think it was like 98% of the species were very, very sensitive, um, but it wasn't very diverse. So um, that's kind of a fine line we have to walk um, as far as interpreting that. Um, but again, it's still important to keep an eye on that. We have sensitive species present, but there's not a whole lot of abundance there. Um, and that could potentially be indicative of maybe that section of stream dries up in the summer. Um, or yeah, in part of the year, um, and then gets recolonized when it fills back up. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, I guess kind of to answer that question. And what was the other one? Something about stream miles? Uh, yeah, just the approximate mileage between those two sites. Oh boy. I would say it's probably ar around 10 miles or a little more than 10 miles, somewhere, somewhere in that range. Um, I know that this reach, uh, thinking back to the other map, we have an eight mile reach of, uh, that's class A brown trout in the East Branch. Um, and that stops around Greenwood Furnace State Park. And since this upstream site goes a little above there, I would say we're, we're probably in that eight to 10 mile range as well um, on the East Branch. Is that, that was, the question was still for East Branch? Yes. 
Okay. Um, and we have another question that came in. To upgrade a section to EV, do you have mul do you have to have multiple years of data to show that the IBIs are consistently elevated? So that we're not sure of yet. So we're actually still relatively new to this whole process. Um, we're, we're going to coordinate with DEP and see if maybe we need to uh, collect some more data this spring to follow up with that. Um, so in order to qualify for EV, there's actually a number of criteria you can meet to make your case. Um, so aside from having that exceptionally high IBI greater than 92, um, some of the other criteria include um, whether uh, the stream flows through a recognized natural area, um, which this one does, the Allen Seeger natural area. Uh, in addition to that, the water has to ha be uh, an ecologically significant uh, resource, um, which based on our uh, IBI, we've shown that it is. Um, and in addition to that, it's also listed as um, natural reproduction trout water. So it has that going for it. Um, and lastly, uh, I think the other one that this site meets is that it has to have some kind of recreation slash economic significance. So again, it goes through a natural area, it flows through a local state park, a local state forest, and it also provides the headwaters to Huntington Borough and Smithfield Township's uh, source of drinking water, which is around 13,000 people. Um, so it's got a lot going for it. And I think we're gonna have a, a pretty strong case to get that upgrade. Um, yeah, yeah, a couple more questions that came in. Um, will you have to do additional sampling to determine where the EV should end? I think so. And I think that's something we'll wanna do in the spring. Um, so even just sampling uh, some sites downstream of that point to maybe see how far does this EV section go um, as well as going upstream uh, to see, yeah, how far does it go above? Um, but I think it's, it's, I think it's safe to say that at this point right here, I mean, this is all a very forested area. There's not a whole lot going on. I can't see that the score is going to get impacted from anything upstream of it. Um, so, but we'll, I, I think part of our plan is this spring is to follow up with some more, some more samples to really fine tune fine tune that recommendation. Excellent. Thank you. That's all we had for right now, but uh, great questions, everybody. Cool. Okay. Went over that. All right. So just some of the uh, brief results of our fish biodiversity survey. Um, so we found a total of 30 species representing eight families. Um, I will note that three of these species were only caught at our downstream reference site um, at Detweiler Park in Huntington. Um, they were the American eel, uh, red breast sunfish, and yellow bullhead, which are generally considered more uh, slow moving warm water fish. Uh, so it makes sense that they were caught down closer to the confluence with the Juniata River um, versus up in the headwaters where it's more uh, forested, uh, more riffles and that type of habitat. Uh, our three most diverse fish families included uh, the minnows, the printidae, we caught 12 species, uh, centrarchidae, which is the panfish, um, things like smallmouth bass and uh, a bluegill uh, consisted of five species, and then persidae, which are our perch and darters, we caught four species. Um, just to note uh, some of our other uh, really significant finds, uh, trout were found at six of the 10 sample sites, so more than half of them. Uh, in addition to that, we had a really unique species um, that we found. Uh, so the mountain red belly dace, we captured at three sites uh, all along Herod Run. That's this uh, picture up here in the top row in the middle. Um, this fish species is not native to Pennsylvania, but it's not necessarily considered invasive. Um, but nobody really knows how it got here. And it's only found in two streams in the entire state of Pennsylvania, and both of them are in Huntington County. So one is Herod Run, and the other is actually um, an unnamed tributary to Shavers Creek just over the ridge. Um, and again, say so this one actually stumped us when we first caught it, uh, as far as identifying it, until we realized like, hey, this is one of the only streams in the entire state with this species. Um, and we actually found some. But again, we're not really sure how it got here. 
Um, and the even bigger mystery is we're not really sure how its presence is impacting the native fish community. Um, that's just no knowledge we don't have right now. Um, I believe it's actually native to West Virginia. And I think one of Fish and Boats theories on how it may have got here um, is that trout fishermen may have accidentally introduced it um, if they came up from that state uh, and used these as bait. Um, and then when they were done releasing some. So that's, I think one of their, their ongoing theories of maybe how it was introduced. Um, so in addition to that really unique species, um, although it was caught at our downstream site, I do wanna make mention of it because I still think it's a really significant find. Um, but we did catch an American eel um, at Detweiler Park in Standing Stone Creek. Uh, so those that aren't familiar with eels, eels are a migratory fish, um, but rather than like salmon, the adults actually migrate from fresh water to salt water to spawn. Um, eels used to be one of the most abundant fish we had um, in the entire Susquehanna drainage um, until we uh, built four hydroelectric dams at the uh, bottom part of the river and essentially uh, eels had became very, very rare. The adults could migrate to the ocean to spawn, but the young couldn't swim back up to repopulate the, the upper watershed. Um, so what uh, Fish and Boat and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has been doing in recent years is they actually catch the eels um, at the mouth of the, or yeah, below the dam, load them into trucks, and then drive them up into the Susquehanna River drainage, and I guess you can't necessarily call it stocking, but releasing them into different areas. And what's really neat is that they don't release them into the Juniata River, and yet American eel sightings have been popping up all over the Juniata, meaning that they're literally being introduced in other parts of the Susquehanna, swimming into the Juniata River, all the way up the Juniata through Lewistown, uh, all the way into Huntington, um, and now into some of our headwater streams. Um, and the eel that we caught at uh, uh, Detweiler is significant because it actually had to have made it around the water intake dam for Huntington Borough. Um, how it got up, I'm not sure, um, but it made it around it, um, and now it's starting to recolonize uh, parts of Standing Stone Creek, which is just a really neat comeback story um, in terms of conservation, uh, and actually I was even more impressed that I was recently told that uh, at Whipple Dam State Park, um, when they drained Whipple Dam to do some maintenance on it, they actually caught an American eel in the dam, meaning that that another one had to have made it around the water intake and water intake dam in Huntington Borough and swam all the way up into Whipple Dam State Park, which is uh, just remarkable to me. Um, so I did want to mention that. I do have a picture of an eel here. Um, this one was not the one we caught. I don't have a picture of the one we caught, but I still wanted to provide that info as well. So moving on from just the basic fish ID that we found. Um, we also utilize this relatively new concept that's being developed by um, the Department of Environmental Protection, and it's called a thermal fish index. Um, and when I say this is brand new, I mean, this is like last year, December 2020, brand new. Um, so I'm going to kind of run it, uh, run through the basics so everyone can understand it. Um, but essentially, this is very similar to an IBI, so we calculated IBIs for Bendic macroinvertebrates, except this TFI is using fish. Um, so the same concept, we're quantifying stream health with a number um, based on what fish we find. The way it works is that um, some of you may be familiar with this study guide from Fish and Boat, but it takes this concept of cold water fish versus warm water fish. So when people think of cold water, a lot of times they think of things like trout, when they think of warm water, they think of like catfish, bass, bluegill, um, stuff like that. So each species is assigned a thermal score ranging from one to five. If a species has a rank of one, it means it's a cold water species. If it has a rank of five, it means of a warm water and kind of everything in between. Three is cool water. If you had a two, it would be kind of like cold, cool. If you had a four, it'd be kind of cool, warm. Essentially, the same thing we did with the IBI is we identify all the fish, we put that information into Excel, it takes into account this thermal score and how abundant each species is in your sample, and then it gives you uh, a TFI score, 
But rather than ranging from zero to 100, this score ranges from two through 10. And a TFI of two means that only cold water species were present in your sample. So if you catch only brook trout, you're gonna get a, a TFI of two. Whereas if you have a TFI equal to 10, means you only have warm water species present. So if you were to sample a pond and only catch bluegill, you would get a sample of or a TFI of 10. So that's how that works. Um, when I heard this presented, I thought this was really neat and definitely wanted to include it um, in this presentation. So here's just a quick overview of all of the fish species we caught during the survey and the breakdown of the thermal score. And I kind of color coded it, but up top we have our cold, cold water species. Um, we had three, the slimy sculp and rainbow trout and brook trout. And then you have the very, very bottom of the range for warm water species. Um, the only five we had was a green sunfish, um, and they were only caught at a couple sites. I will note that mountain red belly dace, um, they haven't assigned a thermal score to it um, because it's not very common throughout Pennsylvania, um, but that's on the list uh, as they're developing this protocol to to get that to get that fish a number because um, it would be beneficial to make sure that this analysis includes it. But now what we found, and I think this is just super awesome stuff or neat stuff at least in terms of, of conservation now. Um, so the impairment threshold. So before for the IBI, our impairment threshold was based on whether a stream was high quality or not. Um, and the value was 63. For the TFI, our impairment threshold is dependent on the size of the drainage area. So for a site that drains less than 25 square miles, if you receive a TFI greater than 4.8, that's what's considered impaired, okay? So here I have all the sites labeled that fall within that category, um, which is all of them except for two. And those are our two um, lower sites on the Standing Stone Creek. Um, but the rest of these all drain less than 25 square miles. And here's what we found based off of um, our fish assemblage that we caught. We had four sites that were significantly above this impairment threshold for this, this drainage size. Um, again, we had three on Herod Run, which uh, we kind of had indicated that with some of our other parameters. But now we're extending outside of Herod Run to this lower site on Laurel Run, um, which actually had one of our highest TFIs. Um, I think that's really unique. Um, it's hard to say what the cause is, but our, our fish are pointing that pointing to some kind of environmental degrade, degradation at this site. Um, so kind of moving forward from that, oh, there I highlighted it just so you could see, we're still kind of in this bottom left corner of the watershed. Now to look at these other two sites. So for sites that drain between 25 square miles, but less than 93 square miles, that TFI value gets bumped up a little bit to a value of six. So anything greater than six is considered impaired. And this is what we found for both of those. The downstream Standing Stone, uh, uh, Standing Stone Creek one was above that threshold. And then although it's right at the value, I included it anyway. Um, but this upper one right above McAlevey's Fort also was within that, that impairment kind of concerning level. Um, so that's, that's what we found from this. So um, everything else, our, our Bendic macroinvertebrates, water chemistry and habitat was pointing to Herod Run as an area of conservation attend or conservation concern. Um, if I pull up this map, this is that section that we recommended um, to be impaired because of our Bendic macroinvertebrates, um, taking into account our fish stuff. We can now say that this section of Standing Stone Creek is the area we need to be focusing on our, our conservation efforts. Um, we're not going to provide an official recommendation that this whole section be listed as impaired, um, again, because this this, uh, this concept still being developed um, and hasn't been finalized yet. Um, but as of right now, as they fine tune that, I'll be sure to update this. Um, this, is, this is what we're finding, um, that this area of the watershed is, is being impacted and that our macroinvertebrates are showing it and now our fish are showing it. So 
moving forward, what does this all mean? So we collected our water quality data. We identified our areas of concern, which I have highlighted in red. What do we do next? So here's kind of the breakdown of what we're gonna be doing moving forward. Um, first things first is we wanna complete this conservation plan. Um, we're gonna hopefully, or we will have that finished by September of this year, um, if not sooner. Um, but once we have that, again, we'll be able to apply for future grants um, with the Cold Water Heritage Partnership to implement uh, restoration projects. Um, but as far as moving forward now in terms of management and conservation, um, we want to make sure we're spending some time uh, reaching out to landowners that live within this watershed and try and line up potential projects. Um, so finding landowners that are willing to implement uh, restoration strategies on their property um, and then acquiring grant money to implement them and then seeing that all through actually getting some stuff on the ground to to make these improvements um, and some of that stuff just to highlight a few um, could be uh, working with farmers to improve uh, whether it's pastures or streams along crop fields um, so this is an example of another site in Huntington County um, as you see on the left that was a before photo um, we work to stabilize the stream bank um, using some natural structures to reduce erosion. Uh, fencing was also installed. Um, and although you can't see it, we did end up planting this with our riparian buffer. Um, but it doesn't necessarily just have to be farmers. It could be just any landowners with stream property. Um, so this is another one. Uh, I believe this one's actually in Blair County. Um, but I do like the before and after picture. Um, this is just a stream in someone's backyard was starting to erode their, uh, the banks and their yard very, very heavily. Um, so the bank was stabilized again with natural stream structures, reseeded with grass. Um, and again, I believe this one was also followed up with a planting of riparian buffers. Um, so we're finding landowners that are willing to do some actual in-stream restoration work, um, as well as some other things. Uh, so I mentioned riparian buffers. Um, riparian buffers don't always have to go with that in-stream stuff. You can just plant riparian buffers along any waterway. Um, so this is a recent project we did in Huntington County um, this fall. Um, we planted about an acre of, of trees and, and shrubs along this stream. And then as well as just some other um, best management practices. So things like streams, or as this other picture shows, uh, this is a stabilized cattle crossing. Um, so the cattle still have access to the stream for water. Um, but rather than having access to the whole stream bank, they're just isolated to this area, um, which has been reinforced with, with stone and gravel to prevent, prevent erosion. In addition to that, the Conservation District also has a very active dirt, gravel, and low volume roads program. Um, our technician works with local municipalities throughout the county um, to identify um, roads like this one here on the left. Um, you can see that the water is running across it, um, eroding uh, a lot of that gravel from it. Uh, and a lot of this can be a source of, of sediment to uh, nearby streams. Um, the program works to uh, get funds that fix those issues. So uh, in this after picture, they've installed drainage pipes um, that help direct the water away from the road, as well as um, they've regraded it so that um, it's tapered to allow the water to, to run off to the edges rather than down down the middle. Um, and then another area that's been uh, kind of a rising focus uh, for that program um, is the replacement of stream crossings um, to improve uh, fish passage. Uh, so you can see in this before picture, this was a, a cross pipe underneath a, a road uh, had collapsed. Say, so obviously fish were not able to swim up and down. Uh, that was serving as a barrier. Um, this municipality worked with our, our technician to install a new cross pipe um, or a new culvert, I guess, um, that allows for, for full, full passage to each side upstream and downstream. Um, and I would like to note at this point too that uh, part of this project, and we will highlight it in the conservation plan, um, is we are actually assessing or trying to assess all of the stream crossings, uh, stream road crossings in the upper standing Stone Creek watershed um, on their ability to allow for, for fish passage. Um, I don't have those results to um, present yet, but we 
we do hope to include that in the conservation plan. So identifying areas in the upper Standing Stone Creek that could benefit and qualify for, for projects such as this one on the right. And with that, I think I did good for time. We're ending just a little bit before seven. Um, I will take any questions, comments, feedback from anyone. I know that was a lot of information to get through. Hopefully it wasn't too confusing, um, but there's my information. We have a website, a Facebook, if you ever want to follow us, we do a lot of posts on, on projects and stuff there. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of open the floor for discussion now. Y'all are welcome to unmute yourselves now and just ask away rather than through the chat. I have a, qu I have a question. Sure. Um, are there currently any uh, state or federal uh, regulations in place that require farmers um, to, to implement mitigating uh, procedures to prevent like things like fertilizers and pesticides from getting into the water? Sure. Um, oh boy, I'm not as familiar with that side of things. I know as far as like- I can answer that one if you want, Logan. Sure. Um, yeah, so there are regulations in place where farmers have to, um, if they generate or apply manure to their property, to their fields, they have to have a manure management plan and they have to, um, you know, basically account for, um, the rates that they're load, that they're applying, um, abide by setbacks. So, um, if there is a forested riparian buffer along their stream, um, they can actually spread manure a little bit closer because that buffer would be filtering. Whereas if they are, um, you know, planting, cropping right up to the stream, the setbacks are a lot further uh, in order to protect water quality. Um, the manure management regulations would also come um, uh, protect against um, heavy animal heavy use areas or like areas where animals congregate if they're like right next to the stream you'd have to have some protection between you know every farm's got those barnyard areas it's just part of farming um, but they've got to have some uh, some green space in between those areas in the stream and, and there's someone that is there anybody that oversees or checks on that kind of stuff yeah, the conservation district. Um, Logan is our watershed specialist. We also have a uh, nutrient management specialist that oversees that. Okay. And if I could ask one more question. It, do you know of any currently any fracking activities north of us that could potentially uh, cause damage or pollute the water the, in the watershed? I'm not familiar with any active um fracking activities within like Roth Rock State Forest itself. Um, no, yeah, Huntington not, County is not very active. Uh, we're kind of marginal for um, for the, the gas outputs. Sure. Um, we did have one well in Todd Township in southern Huntington County, um, but it's it's not even active anymore. Oh, good. Yeah, I know the the Marcellus movement was real big a couple of years ago, um, especially in like the northern tier of Pennsylvania. Um, I don't think we had too much activity down this way. Um, maybe maybe some here and there, but nothing nothing that, that local that we should be concerned of in this watershed at least. Okay, well, thank you. Logan, was, was the entire um, um, Stone Creek watershed considered high quality cold water or was that just the upper section? The entire watershed is. Um, so all of the upper watershed that we discussed, um, and then as well as even the lower portion, um, which wasn't our, our focus area. So everything in Stone, the entire standing Stone Creek all the way down to the mouth with the Juniata um, is considered high quality cold water. In, in spite of all the warm water fish that are living in the lower part. In spite of the, the lower, yeah, the warmer water that are living down uh, at the lower site. Um, especially that lower site, um, because it's so close to the, the mouth of the Juniata River, and the Juniata River is a more warmer water fishery, um, I would say it's not that surprising that we're finding some, some warm water species, uh, especially at Detweiler. Um, but as far as those, 
those upper sites in the upper standing stone. Um, it, it, that's definitely interesting that we're we're picking those up. I mean, I would expect to see, you know, some here and there, but the abundance of it, um, I think, is what really points to I think something's going on. Um, right. And I have one other question. It seemed unusual that the the east branch, the benthic in index, was somewhat low. And it's the it's the uh, class A wild trout, and yet the upper Stone Creek had the exceptional value um, readings, and yet it's not considered a class A wild trout. Yeah. Then, yeah. Well, what was the question? I'm sorry. Oh, the, the question just just it, it seemed unusual to me. Uh, that that was the case that that uh, you know maybe the upper section of stone creek needs to be reassessed for for uh trout mass sure and i would I, I would think that's maybe something to consider moving forward as well i mean i don't i know um east branch has been assessed recently actually i think we were talking before um 2019 i think was when they assessed the east branch i don't know the last time they assessed um uh, standing stone creek itself um okay but uh it's something to to at least consider um thank you i know our fish surveys in the upper parts um did come back as they, they fell below that threshold so i kind of focused on on the, the more i guess the bad stuff or the stuff that was standing out as being impaired um but i didn't mention that like the upper sites in along laurel run and standing stone creek and even all of East Branch, um, our our fish that thermal fish index came back really good within that well below that that uh, impairment threshold. Um, so those those ones were good in terms of that. We had a question come in on the chat. Um, since the PFI came out later in 2020, after your sampling was completed, did your fish sampling protocol? protocol match the sampling protocol mentioned for the TFI? Sure. So our, uh, yes, our, the short answer is yes. Um, our fish sampling protocol still followed all of DEP's um, protocol for um, fish surveys in general. Um, this is more of, the protocol is more of for the behind the scenes analysis stuff of what we found. Um, so as far as Anything changing uh, methods wise during the collection, uh, there's nothing, nothing that stands out there. Um, theoretically, I, I suppose if you had collected samples from 10 years ago using these DEP protocols, you could calculate TFIs and, and still get some kind of data out of it. Um, but I think this is more of a, a new concept that they're they're slowly starting to wean into um, to incorporate in a lot of future future assessments. It's going to be more so rather than just to know what's there and actually being able to apply it. Logan, I'm, I've been curious about crayfish in uh, main stem of standing stone, especially. Um, off of Detweiler Field, I've just seen really high densities of them, and I assume that they're invasive rusty crayfish. I'm not sure about that, but um, I was wondering, were you finding lots of crayfish as you went upstream? Um, how far up do they go, and do you have any indication that they're causing problems for the native species? Sure. So yeah, so the rusty crayfish um, are really, really bad invasive species that are really abundant in the Juniata River. Um, during this study, we only really observed rusties um, at the lower portions of Standing Stone Creek. Um, so like our site at Detweiler Run, or yeah, at Detweiler Park. Um, I guess our farthest downstream site in our study area was at Jackson's Corner. Um, if I recall correctly, and I'd have to look back at my notes, we didn't see um, any rusties, but we were finding uh, Allegheny crayfish which are another non-native species, but they're not generally considered as invasive as rusties. Um, but it's very possible that they could still be having uh, some kind of impact to the native 
aquafauna, whether that's the macroinvertebrates or whether they're feeding on uh, trout nests, smallmouth bass nests, that type of stuff. Um, that wasn't something we dove into uh, too much in this in this study itself. Um, but I do know that uh, Juniata College actually has an ongoing study where they're uh, looking at several streams in Huntington County. Um, they're, they are assessing rusty crayfish in the presence and uh, that type of stuff. We've got another question in the chat. Sure. How do you think the thermal fish index will factor into HQ and EV designations? Ooh, I don't know if I'm the right person to ask about that right now, because I'm still pretty new to this. Um, I don't think they know yet, and I think it'll probably be a good amount of time till they really figure out how to take this concept and make it fit within the whole legal, bureau bureaucratic kind of portion of everything. Um, that's some stuff that people much smarter than me are and much higher up than me are, are going to have to figure out once once they establish the final protocol. Once they have everything worked out, I think that's they'll they'll start taking that a little more seriously. Um, as far as uh, as far as that type of stuff, the high quality in the EV. Logan, that's a really good point to bring up is that all of these designations um, could be challenged in court. And so that's why, um, you know, your protocol is really rigorous in terms of identifying to the genus level and, and the subsampling and, and all of that. And uh, it's yeah. It's and, a, yeah, I guess I didn't mention that before. Um, but again, all of our stuff followed PAD, PADP protocol. And the reason for that is not only do we want this information to be used uh, by ourselves at the conservation district, um, but we also want it to be applicable to the state level. Um, so we want agencies like the Fish and Boat Commission, DEP, DCNR, to be able to utilize our data um, to regulate the waterways, add protections, fund projects, um, track improvements or degradation. Um, that's a big emphasis on why we're doing this whole thing in the first place is we want this pl final plan to be a resource for state agencies, nonprofit organizations, local landowners, public universities, institutions. I mean, it's that's that's the ultimate goal um, is that all of this stuff can be used at all levels. Excellent. The only other thing we have in the chat is a note from Rachel, just to let everybody know that all of the Cold Water Heritage Partnership funded conservation plans and their implementation projects can be accessed on their website. It is www.coldwaterheritage.org. And once this plan is complete, it will be there as well. All right, well, that's everything I have. I got no other bug fish info to share with you, but I can hang around to answer any other questions. Thanks for everything. And even in the future, if you wanna, if you're if you're looking for someone to talk about stuff in Huntington County with regard to these projects, um, I have my contact information there. Um, feel free to shoot me an email or or give me a call. Um, Logan, I saw that George Maravich dropped off, but you might want to catch up with Chris Grant at Juniata as well. I know he was doing some ag sampling and doing some membrane sampling of, of water. I'm not exactly sure where his sample locations were, um, but he, he noticed some anomalies as well that he was kind of tie into agriculture. So cross-referencing that might give you some additional insights as well. Sure. So yeah, I know he's, I know he's a very active person uh, in and out of the county. Um, so he's actually, yeah, I, I didn't think of him before. He's probably a good one to reach out to actually. Um, and actually, he, since his, his name came up, he's actually the person that first discovered that mountain red belly dace 
uh, in Huntington County and the adjacent stream uh, in Shavers Creek. Um, so he's he's the reason we know they're around. Do you know if Grand's published any of those, uh, like any of the papers pertaining to his membranes? Uh, the only one that I know was published um, was with uh, a colleague of mine uh, when I graduated in 2018, Ben Martin. Um, he does have, uh, I've read it, I don't know the title of it, but it's a publication that talks about, um, they essentially looked at emerging contaminants um, throughout the Juniata River watershed. Um, so not just Standing Stone Creek, although they did have a site in Standing Stone Creek, um, but he was spread out through Little Juniata, Oglick, I mean, all, all over the place. But I know, I know that exists out there. Right. Excellent mm -hmm. job, Logan. Um, tons of great compliments in the chat box. So thank you. We really appreciate it. This was really exciting. Hey, thank you guys. I told Selena before when we were organizing this, I didn't know if five people would sign up, 20 people or how many. So I'm happy that I'm happy that people actually wanted to participate and were willing to listen. So thank you all. See you later.